I wish to acknowledge that Bunarong, we were wrong, and whether we're wrong, peoples of the nation, the traditional owners of and custodians of the land where I'm posting the seminar today, I pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. And so, um, as I've said, this was a, generally a, uh, a uh, in person uh, only seminar to develop, uh, redevelop, reboot all the uh, Monash campus community and now. Uh, near and near uh, partners in the area, in the city, industry partners and government partners. Um, we do from time to time um, provide links for those of us who are in the state who, you know, probably wouldn't jump on a plane, always come, come and see, although they, they all should have to come and visit the Cape. Um, but um, and we'll be holding these every month and a range of topics of interest to both researchers across multiple disciplines. Economics, engineering, computer science, um, arts, social sciences, ethnography, etc. Uh, but talking about really deep, important issues from either technical or economic uh, or uh, any other discipline in a, in a way that's um, understood by a general educated audience. And so I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Kate Summers. Kate Summers is a fellow of the Institute of Engineers and an experienced power systems and control engineer with extensive experience, 28 years actually of engineering practice in power systems and um, markets and regulatory aspects. And that's very important, coupling all those, which we'll have to talk about today. Um, in 2020, Kate was jointly awarded National Professional Electrical Engineer, sorry, that's mm -hmm. Electrical Engineer of the Year for her work identifying the root cause of the deterioration of the system, system frequency. And uh, I think Kate will talk a little bit about that. Kate's recent focus has been on control philosophy, shedding light on the unintended consequences of market based decisions in respect of control theory, loss of power system engineering practices, and the escalating complexity of regulations in both of engineering. And uh, I think I'll just hand over from this point to Kate. And uh, we look forward to a lovely debate after the talk. Obviously, we'll all be in serious agreement. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, thank, thank, you, thank you, Ariel, and um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak today. Um, it's been quite some time um, since I've had a face-to-face -face presentation. Um, I'll touch on that uh, in a little while. Um, today's topic, power system dynamics, the ignored science. So we are going to step through uh, some of the theory on power system dynamics, in particular frequency control dynamics. Uh, and we're going to look at closed loop control and uh, basically the fundamental understanding of what markets do to closed loop control in the power system. Um, I work for Akistica now, and just a brief note on Akistica. Akistica is based in Alice Springs. It's a small engineering technical advisory firm that's been running for about 15 years. Uh, we do encourage uh, graduates to come and apply for work up at Alice Springs. Uh, we give great field experience and practical outcomes on a wide range of projects, everything from remote area power supply right the way through to some of the largest infrastructure projects in the country, uh, which uh, and also work through the Asia Pacific as well. So just a little bit on Akistica, if anyone's interested, you can talk to me later. Right. Um, I've given this lecture a number of times now, and every time I give it, it changes in its content and a little bit in the finish. Uh, and I first time I gave this lecture was February 2020 uh, to IEEE PES at Melbourne University in February 2020. It would have been one of the last face-to-face -face lectures that we had prior to lockdown. Uh, and it was dedicated to Roger Bolden, who was my ex-boss uh, and a power system dynamics expert in the SECB, who had passed away in November 2019. Uh, and Professor Wallace, who some of you may recall from Monash, was actually present in that lecture. He now, too, has sadly passed away. So, um, and when I finished this particular topic, um, and the reason why this uh, lecture changes from time to time is because I got to the very end and one of the young engineers in the front row put his hand up and asked me, so where are all these control systems? And it floored me because I thought I'd explained it, but we're going to try to elevate ourselves into the understanding of where these controls lie, what they are and how we 
aggregate our thinking about complex controls. Um, just a little bit on electricity. Um, I, I do want to remind everybody of the forces that we deal with. And uh, just topically, I noticed that you've lost your high voltage uh, power laboratory from uh, Monash, which clearly would have once upon a time given you a visual uh, realization of the forces of electricity that you are dealing with. And now you're down to dealing in small electronic boards, which everything seems quite contained and easy. But let's just remind ourselves of the forces that we're dealing with. And um, this is the type of incident that can happen in power stations. Thanks to the age, we have this picture of Calide C. And if you notice, um, does the mouse work? Yes, here's part of the shaft lying in the middle of the generating hall. Um, quite a significant uh, damage. I don't think this generator is coming back. And certainly the transformer on the outside in the switchyard had shifted on its foundations, was quite distorted. Um, yeah, there was a few bent pieces all over the place. So people need to understand the uh, physical, uh, electrical, magnetic, dynamic forces that actually occur when faults happen. I think AEMO's report said a fault happened. And if you actually examine this, this was the rotor deviating into the stator at speed um, more than once. So clearly not just a single fault. Um, we'll touch on this event a little bit later on. Um, and if we look at another one, which happened in August, 2009, um, this is in Russia and Unfortunately, 75 people were killed at the time when this event occurred. And there's a number of different speculations about what happened in this event. Uh, but there is one theory that there were control system changes made that were adverse with respect to the water column and the control of the governor guide vanes. And therefore, they sped everything up to do some sort of aggregate dispatch. It was not convenient to the water column, which of course is physical and you can't change. And uh, therefore uh, it, there was water column separation. Unit two pulled itself apart. And as a result, seven and nine also pulled themselves out of the generating hall. So let's just think about this. It took 200 years for human curiosity and scientific inquiry to understand and establish the laws of electricity, of charge and magnetism. It took another hundred years for us to research as engineers and apply the science that we understood, researching how to control the power that we create in generators, and then how to control those generators within a power system that underpins the complex multi-machine system that forms the basis of power systems within our societies and generally provides electricity that underpins the economic well-being of uh, any community. So it's somewhat shocking to realize that in the period of my career, through the application of free market think economics and belief systems, we have displaced engineering from the infrastructure and replaced it with consensus rulemaking driven primarily through self-interest. So over the last five years and driven a little bit out of frustration and annoyance at the media narrative uh, which tended to be coupled with political waffle and ill-informed uh, blame games. I started with my colleague, Ryan Jennings, um, at Pacific Hydro at that time to, to analyse what was really going on in the power system because I just didn't believe the narrative that was being put forward. And Ryan being uh, a whiz kid with computing, to which, as I'll fill you in later, I'm not really that whiz, he can manipulate large data sets in a way that I have no idea how to do. So he charted the four second data, which AEMO has, and uh, prepared, uh, th th they gather this four second data for the regulation FCAS. It's available to people. Um, it's used for the cause of pays calculation. I asked Ryan to chart that, to chart that data by means of market category, which means that we divided the data into the megawatts attributable to the scheduled generators, the semi-scheduled generators and the non-scheduled generators. If you um, look at this uh, from the perspective, the scheduled generators are effectively 
what all of our politicians would refer to as base load. In other words, they underpin the system. They're 33 in this um, chart, 33 to 33.5 gigawatts of power across the eastern seaboard. And the semi-scheduled generation is the wind uh, industry, or the wind power at that time, which was about 650 megawatts. And the non-scheduled is a collective of all the small generators. Some of it will be small hydros, some of it will be cogeneration, some of it, generally it's the sub 30 megawatt, uh, some of it's wind power. Effectively, it's sitting down just above 300 megawatts. So the collective of the semi-scheduled and non-scheduled is in fact just under one gig or just on one gig. And we've got 33 at the top. At this time, everybody was claiming that the renewable energy was the cause of all the deviations and all the instability in the power system. And the renewable energy was paying the lion's share of the cause of pays factors in the regulation market. And I just could not believe that 600 megawatts would be pushing around the power system. And hence, we produced this chart. And if we look at it, New South Wales was actually under stress at the time. There were high imports into New South Wales and a gas generating unit ramped off and effectively at this point started, we started to see this bang bang type uh, growing oscillation that runs for over seven minutes. It's a 24 second period on these charts. And uh, once you start to analyze what's going on, you can see the generating units that have aggregate controls causing issues. You see interactions on the AGC and a number of other things that were happening. But we get to the point where we say, okay, what is the cause of this problem? In 2018, we then had this event um, where the Queensland interconnector tripped off on a lightning strike. So both lines went down um, and Queensland was exporting to New South Wales at that time around 800 megawatts. Uh, and you can see in orange, the frequency in, New, in Queensland uh, went up to about 50.7 and stayed there for over 12 minutes. And then finally, after 12 minutes, which approximately is at least two to three uh, dispatch intervals in the market, finally, somewhere a constraint may have been applied, which finally started to drive them back towards 50, which sits down here. Uh, South Australia fell off uh, in, in sympathy with this event, and it was resynchronized somewhere around this uh, marker here, just after uh, 1330, I think. I didn't produce that chart. Uh, from from AEMO's reports, uh, but you can see it took quite some time uh, to resynchronize the system. And uh, in the final report for this particular event during 2018, AEMO acknowledged the loss of primary frequency control in the power system, and they admitted or actually established that they had an inability to simulate the frequency and they need better modeling. Better modeling, right. So I'm not going to go into uh, why frequency control is important. I think that that's a fundamental, uh, given that frequency and active power are interrelated and it's all a part of the balance equation. But we are going to look at what's happened in the eastern seaboard uh, as a result of um, the changes made uh, over time dating back. So let's just think for a little while. Um, When we think about the power system uh, in terms of the period in which we developed um, power systems, it's a complex, non-linear, multi-machine problem. And if we go back to when power was really being developed or power systems were being developed, there were no computers of the type that you have today. There was a fundamental understanding of the science. There was a lot of mathematical work that went into it. When I did my degree, I know that the largest computer that I had on my desk was a 286 with a floppy disk drive. It was a glorified word processor, right? And occasionally we used it for some calculations, but not many. Contemplate, what was the floppy disk? 360 KB or something like that, right? You know, not that long ago, right? Not that long ago. So to solve complex problems, the engineers had to use first principles and simplify into uh, mathematical methods, ways in which they could visualize, interpret and improve their understanding of what they expected to see 
by using uh, approximate models or approximate methods, mathematical methods, in order to identify what they expected in the system or to improve their insight into what they would expect the system to do. So here we go back through into closed loop control. Closed loop control is there to reduce the error and to bring the output to a desired value. Right? We want to reduce error in terms of what we measure through our feedback loops. Right? Fundamental one. The objective in an, of an electricity energy system is always, <laughs> and I checked Elgerd and I checked Kundor, right? So Elgerd included supply everywhere the customer demands. Well, that might vary a little bit in, in the modern day and age because the customer may actually have a method of supplying themselves. But the load and the demand and the active and reactive power vary over time and the system must be able to supply this ever-changing demand, okay? We want to deliver it with constant frequency and constant voltage with high reliability, and it should deliver energy at the minimum economic and ecological costs. I like that last one. That was drafted in the 70s. Okay, so to elevate the, the thinking around how we consider an area of control in, in a power system, the swing equation is used from the point of view of looking at an area of control. And we take the swing equation, it's valid for frequency deviations where we have strong coupling between generators and we linearize the system inertia. And we put it into a, 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 a model for the power system without control. We consider what the frequency dependency is on the loads. So in this equation, if we think about it, a change in electrical power or an imbalance between electrical power and mechanical power means that you'll get a rate of change of frequency. If P, P mech and P elec equal each other, there's no rate of change of frequency. Right? Now, I've just got a sub note here. All my control blocks here come from Goran Anderson's lecture notes, except for where I've twiddled with them. So I, later on, you'll see that I've twiddled with them. All right, so just acknowledging Goran Anderson in, in his lecture notes there. Okay. So if we consider that we've got um, an uncontrolled um, system, when we have a step change on this system, it's the load relief that arrests that system to the point where it balances again. If there is no balancing there as a result of load relief, the system will continue to decline. Can everybody appreciate that, right? We're, we're, we're gonna stay with a falling frequency. It's just going to keep going down. So we don't leave it in a system where we're uncontrolled. We put control in. Now here's where that young engineer who asked me, where are all these controls, right? So that we're, gonna, we're gonna deal with that question. In a synchronous system, we approximate the control of each generator by using the governor control, right? So that the governor controls will adjust the mechanical power into the electrical power out on the terminals of a machine. We all understand that, p mech equals p elec, and we control that through uh, the, the governor controls on the machine. Now, each type of technology actually has slightly different characteristics in governor control. So this block diagram only represents one particular type of governor. But you can imagine in a world where you've got steam, where you've got hydro, where you've got gas turbines, et cetera, you can incorporate other blocks into this to actually represent the lumps of those generators and their characteristics. Because you know that the governor control on a hydro is distinctly different from the governor control on a steam turbine, right? The speed with which they respond is dependent on the water column. So we know that when a hydro starts to act, it sort of goes a little bit backwards before it goes forward. Well, not, it's not backwards, it gasps before it blows, right? Oh, a governor. Yeah, actually, oh, there are those controls, okay. Actually, this is a very important point. 
um, because I was thinking a lot about this with respect to the grid forming and the grid following inverter problem, right? When we control a rotating machine, we use the mechanical measurement of its rotating shaft to inform the speed control loop to ensure that we increase or decrease the mechanical power to match the electrical power. We do not measure frequency in an at the terminals electrically to do that control. Can anybody suggest a reason why? Well, firstly, it's available. It's a mechanical measurement. It's always going to be there. If we practically measured the frequency on the electrical side, during faults, the frequency is illogical, irrational, and unmeasurable, right? Therefore, if we took that signal and put it into our control systems, what would happen to our machines? <laughs> Not good. So we use the rotational speed of the shaft to inform the control system in order that we have continuous measurement available into the control system to respond. If we think about grid following, using the electrical measurements on the terminals of the inverter, it's flawed as a long-term aspect because when you have deviations in the power system, such as faults, your measurement goes irrational. And you're using that to inform your control system, right? Mostly. I might be right or wrong, I don't know. Yeah. I'll let you guys sort with that one, okay? So, so hence, it's very important to think about how we use that in, in terms of the control of synchronous machines. Therefore, when we go to grid forming, we've got to find a way to do that without relying on an electrical measurement on the outside world when the outside world is not measurable, All right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so this represents only one, uh, one type of response. And as we can see, we can have a set point in power but we also have a response coming in through the integrator, which is going to respond to the rate of change of frequency. And therefore, collectively, we're going to have an electrical versus mechanical power balance across the system. And what we've done is we've approximated all of those machines within the power system into this block diagram. Now, we can refine that block diagram. As I said, we'll, we'll touch on that later. I've got a simplified version here. And when we think about when a step change occurs to this block diagram, the only thing that's going to happen is it will rebalance to a new steady state equilibrium. That does not mean it has returned that area of control to 50 hertz, right? It has just balanced it out and stopped it from going further south, and it's basically recovering it to whatever those generators can do in that instance. And so, therefore, we then add to that. An, an area control error that has a bias in it that will enable the generator to the generators to respond to a, a an extra signal to say we need more power to recover to 50. Okay, so that's the area control error. Now, in a small system, you can put that bias on the controls of the generator, which is what we did up at the ORD, where we've only got two generators and we've got two lines and we've got load. That's it. So we controlled frequency. We also did the time error correction. But in a big system, that comes out of the centralized system control. So now we build up our area control. So it's time for us to think about the hierarchy in that control of that system. So if we look at the generation, we talk down in the power stations across, or be they wind farms or solar farms, uh, we'll, we'll touch on those later, you've got your power station control, your turbine control, your voltage control. Within your distribution and transmission system, you have your reactive power flow compensation, your fax devices, oh, if we're planning for voltage support. Yep, that's great. Tap changer controls, et cetera. And out in load land, not normally controlled, but maybe, right, in our brave new world, which was fine. Everything within this lower block, within the network, has primary controls at the first instance. And sitting over that is our control center, which is doing its state estimation, power flow, and economic dispatch and security assessment. Right? So it's a second order 
control system that is removed from the primary controls, right? We just have to remember that we've got to have a hierarchy in our thinking. And of course, all of that hierarchy in the thinking is actually uh, through the nested control of time within which certain controls have to act. Now, this, this chart has been updated in the power system stability definition, which David was part of. I haven't updated it here to include that, um, but it's very necessary to understand that once we get down into uh, the area of inverted control, we are well down into the microsecond area, all right, which we all understand from our switching stuff. Okay, so we've now got a hierarchy, we've got a control, we've got uh, uh, a, a nested control system, and we then contemplate what happens when we put two areas. So we've approximated one area into a single machine with load because they're coupled within that area. We can tie it together to another area, single machine with load, but it's very, very important to understand what happens between those two areas. I used to teach transient stability a little bit when I was at NEMCO and we had a model which had magnets in it and it was rotating. We used to, used to talk about stretching the magnet apart, like stretching between areas. So in this instance, what's really important between the left and the right-hand side of the tie line is that the angle, the, the units that are exporting energy across the tie line will be advanced, electrically advanced on the area that is receiving. So you've got an electrical angle that you have to monitor or make sure that you do not exceed or stretch <laughs> the spring constant of your tie line too far apart. Otherwise, when you do have a disturbance, you can lose synchronism. Right? So we have to understand the interactions. Now, my next slide is a very poor, a very poor simplified diagram of area control and, and tie line. This is a simplified diagram. Please go back to Goran's um, um, notes for the full diagram of what that tie line control looks like. Uh, but it's very important to understand that both areas are receiving uh, an input signal to tell them what's going on and to adjust in accordance with uh, the limits that should be there for the tie line. So they do not. And, and of course, rotor angle is a key point. Um, after the South Australian separation and the whole comment about going into connecting New South Wales to South Australia, I did in a public forum ask a particular energy ex executive who should know better uh, what they were doing about the rotor angle, you know, like the control because and he, he said, oh, that's too hard at this point in time, Kate. So it's very sad. <laughs> so if we go back to sort of like when I was a, hmm, not long after my graduation, you know, and working inside uh, what was the end of the SECV and the start of the market, uh, we had uh, three states interconnected. So New South Wales interconnected to Victoria since Snowy was put in, and then we had South Australia interconnected post-1985. Each of those areas had tie line bias between them, and each area had its own area of control. Now, I've done a bit of research on this, and I, it still stuns me to this day. Somewhere towards the end of the three-state market, and prior to or about the time when we went into the NEM, which was the end of 1999, there was a decision made that the interconnectors could be controlled through the dispatch of constraints. And so when Victoria lost its control room because Queensland outbidded them by offering their control room for a dollar, the Victorians lost the control room. It went up to Queensland. So we had we didn't interconnect Queensland for another year or two. So in this picture for the three state, we wound up with the area control measured inside Sydney, controlling and dispatching the NEM, no tie line bias. The frequency reference is at Sydney. Looks good for New South Wales. Not so good when you separate South Australia or Victoria from New South Wales because it takes until the control room can implement an instance of the AGC, put the right information in there. They've now got a button to do it, sort of, but that still takes human intervention before they can get control of that region. Right? Just 
letting that digest for a moment. <laughs> okay. So um, if we go through it and think about what's happened across our market in the decisions that we've made over time. And the reason I look at this is because if I go through the original rules and then I look at the starting rules, the rules as they are now, I can see where the market has intervened in areas which the market was never intended to intervene in, including chapter four. Chapter four was originally drafted around power system control understanding understanding of contingencies, understanding of what can go wrong, understanding of what a credible contingency is, and an understanding of your worst contingency. Your worst contingency normally being the loss of the interconnector. Non-credible in most cases, but can still happen and happens more frequently these days than we like. So the trail of decisions goes like this. We took a decision to make it. The NEM was going to be a single area of control because it's a big electrical pool, isn't it, right? So we're just going to dispatch and compete across. We turned off the tie line bias, and we decided that market constraints would replace that engineered control. I don't know why we didn't make a more sophisticated method of dealing with that, but anyway. So that happened approximately between 90 seven to 98, maybe 99. I'm still trying to find when that occurred. In 2001, the whole world became obsessed with ancillary services and the discussion came up about the development of the FCAS market. And um, there was um, some changes made in um, the period prior to 2008 where they developed the technical standards for the wind industry because the wind power was coming on. So by 2000. And seven, 2008, we altered the technical standards and created S52511, which is frequency control. And then we've also got another one, S52514, which is active power control. Frankly, the more I look at this, I think, why did we do that? Like, how did we think that you could do that that says follow your dispatch target in a linear fashion? And at the same time, we're telling you must not increase your active power in response to high frequency and you must not decrease your active power in response to low frequency. Go figure. Okay. Anyway, so that's what we did. So we also, at the same time, the frequency operating standards widened the normal operating band. And uh, then uh, there were ramp rate rule changes, a reclassification for contingency events. And that one in 2008, where the AER proposed 423A is a significant one. Ah, yes, yes, yeah, okay. So, well, well, so so with the FCAS market, and this is this is where the trail of decisions and the compounding doesn't actually become evident until, and I think sometimes it takes up to 15 years before you see what you've done when you've decided to do something 15 years ago. So we'll 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 illustrate that. When the market was developed in 2001, everybody was fresh out of the power industry. The large generators still had a lot of power engineers. We had a lot of power engineers inside NEMCO. We knew that that market was an enablement market only. In other words, it's a market over there. If you're enabled in the market, you get paid. If you're not enabled, you don't get paid. But everybody provided frequency control. All right, the governors were still the same. All right, the governor control systems, as per as where they didn't change overnight, right? They were still the same. Now, this is where practical field experience versus what we think is happening is really important to understand. In practice, control systems are only upgraded approximately once between 10 to 15 years, right? depending on the obsolescence of the controller, the support for the controller, the age of the equipment, the um, asset management plan, the capital expenditure of the company, blah, 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 right? All of that sort of stuff feeds into all of that. So generally, we don't see an over the night change just because a rule's changed. We don't see it then. And this is really important. This is why I'm doing these lectures because the next one, if we think about it, what happened in the rules was an allowance for everybody to introduce a delay in their control systems. Now, did they introduce them right back then? 
No. But were they allowed to introduce it possibly? Yes, because the rules said so. And when people read the rules, not understanding the purpose of frequency control, in fact, some people even think frequency is something completely different to power. But anyway, um, okay. So, um, so the, the rules allowed that slack to enter. So keep that in mind. Okay. So the decisions and the compounding consequences continue. So in 2009, they redrafted the market ancillary service specification, included ramp rates, did all sorts of other bits and pieces. When I read it, I look at it and I go, Bleh. <laughs> it doesn't make sense from frequency control. Don't They introduced switching controllers, you know. Uh, and then between 2009 and 2012, there were a couple of significant things that happened. Clearly, unit control upgrades were occurring. The implementation of the ramp rate rule was starting to come in. That meant that generators were now being controlled via the AGC, sort of through the AGC to follow a ramp rate right? in accordance with their dispatch instruction. The FCAS controllers became a common thing in the power system. And also somewhere around 2012, the large generators in New South Wales went up for sale. And therefore there was a change of ownership on some of the largest units in New South Wales. Now, when a, a new owner buys an old aged asset, they put capital expenditure into it. They upgrade their control systems to conform to their market dispatch methods, their trading, et cetera. So all of a sudden we start. So in 2014, we started to see the frequency degradation, not that anyone was watching. So one thing I haven't included in here, in 2000, but the borderline between 2008 and 2009 was significant for another reason. Can anybody guess? Ariel can't think. Yep, somewhere around there. What happened? Major change structurally in the market. No, yeah, that was there. Yep. No, Baslink came in in 2004, five. Yeah. No, no, come on. Nemco went from being Nemco and AEMO became AEMO and the constitution changed and we all became stakeholders. We forgot about participants. And the other thing that happened was a change of management, right? Inside AEMO, they became the market operator rather than the electricity market management company, right? And the electricity being upfront, they became the energy market operator and, and they merged with gas. And then there was a big, you know, reorganization on skills and um, organizational management organization. Around the period of 2012, there were changes in the control room and somewhere AEMO stopped doing their quarterly or their monthly monitoring of frequency, which was actually a requirement since the market had started. They stopped looking at frequency. Didn't need to do that. Why do we need to do that? Okay. So frequency degrades, FCAS dispute uh, $65 million into South Australia, paid for by customers and wind farms mainly. Uh, we went to dispute. We lost the dispute. Why? We won the technical argument. We didn't win the legal argument. AEMO has the legal powers to do whatever they want. So we can be right technically. We can lose it legally. Uh, 2016, of course, South Australia went black. Okay. I won't touch too much on that one. It's all point. Okay. So um, with Ryan using the four second data, we charted this chart. Now it doesn't extend clearly right the way up to September 2020. It actually degraded further. But this is the histogram. I love it. It's in feminist colors, suffragette colors. Go. Thank you, Ryan, for putting it into purple, green, and white. Yay, Women's Day. That's all right. Um, okay. So that gives you a bit of a picture of what we were doing with the four second data. That's the four second data dating right the way back to 2011. Uh, and it sort of gives you an idea of what's going on. Slide number am I up to? I haven't got slide numbers on there. Okay. So let's now go back to our control block diagram. What have we done to our control block? So with the unit control upgrades that clearly, if I go back up, right? So clearly around 2014, yes, there was an increase in the amount of wind farms right? That's true. However, there was also 
change of ownership on large units and other things going on and ramp rate rule changes. So let's go back. We had the dead band there. We were allowed to have a dead band up to the boundary of the normal operating band, which was a 300 millihertz dead band. Quite a large dead band when we think about what that means. If you sit down and calculate, if the frequency varies across that range, what is the variation in voltage as the second order effect? It happens, right. We have enablement and disablement coming into the system. In other words, generators were literally making themselves insensitive to frequency because they could, under the market dispatch, I'm only going to provide FCAS if I'm enabled, which was not the original intention. However, it's now become the intention. Under the NEM dispatch engine, we're getting a forecast. So the forecast, right, that's the guesswork where we used to just use a thick pen to actually sort of represent where we thought maybe the peak was going. But, you know, um, that, that forecast comes through and you get a ramp rate through the AGC ramping the generating units to follow the ramp in accordance with the dispatch instruction. And if we look at this, we've got the regulation FCAS still coming through from the AGC to those who are providing regulation FCAS. But let's contemplate um, what this does. Now, this is a simplified single area. We've still got the timelines. We're still technically, not only are we South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, we're also Queensland by this stage. So we've got areas that are technically still an area, and weakly interconnected to other areas with limited control on the tie lines, or no control on the tie lines really, other than the constraint dispatch, right? Which means that they get updated once every five minutes. So in the forecast, remember that the forecast and the dispatch engine receives SCADA data prior to the boundary of the five minutes. So it does take actual measurements from the system approximately in accordance with SCADA and puts that into the dispatch to inform the dispatch of that boundary. And that's important to remember for later on, all right? So now we've got this situation where we're effectively, so what does it start to look like when we look at this? Frequency in blue, dispatch in red. This is Tarong during 2016. And as you can see, frequency's gone into that haywire period. And all of a sudden you've got a ramping dispatch. We're at 50. It's still about 50, but we keep on going upwards. These are small amounts, but nevertheless, that's what we're controlling too. Here's another example. 2017, uh, Bayswater uh, frequency, I've drawn it in in black, so you can see where 50 is. Clearly, the frequency went high. The generator was still going up. It sort of did a little bit through a peak. Clearly, there must have been some sort of dead band, and then it kept on going up and through and then dropping back down again. Right. You can see, not sure whether we've got control here. So the change continues. South Australian system black, then we had the Finkel review, technical rule change, M MFRT, multiple fault ride through came in as a rule. You'll ride through anything because we can change that and ignore the system impedance changes that occur when you do that. System strength rule change, inertia subsystems. And uh, in 2018, we still had that separation event but in 2018-19, we proposed, there were two groups. One came with um, Peter Sokolowski, um, chair of the Electrical College at that stage with frequency rule proposal. We put that in in May and in August, um, AEMO caught up with us and put their, zone, their own one in. Early in 2017, the frequency rule change was made and we did not change a generator control system until September 2020 for the stage one rollout of retuning and imp implementing droop control. So given that the frequency pro was problematic from 2014 and it was raised in 2017 as an issue, we do not change controls until we actually get to 2020, September 2020. Now, um, just a note here for anybody practicing in the field. If you identify a problem in your protection systems or your control systems, you are obligated immediately to do something to fix that. If your protection systems are, are wrong and you don't do something, you're probably voiding your insurance. 
And here we are with the largest system that underpins the Eastern Seaboard, and we don't do anything for four years. Just contemplate that one for a moment. Now, in January 21, and it's worthwhile reading this report because I think it's completely misled, uh, AEMO lost SCADA. All SCADA went down for 53 minutes. Contemplate 53 minutes loss of SCADA and contemplate what the NEMDE was using to create dispatch signals. The only reason the system did not collapse or have problems was the fact that we had droop control implemented. Otherwise, there was no closed loop control on the power system and the dispatch engine was being fed bad data from 53 minutes out. But when AEMO drafts a report, and I'm sorry, I'm going to say it, they measured the response of the generating units against their dispatch targets. So we need to have a little think about what's going on there and really try to work out what did happen and what was the megawatts in that area. Okay, Calide C and the separation. So let's have a little look. The frequency distribution, uh, as I've, this has been a, a frequently published, we compared the 15 years between what, what did the frequency histogram look like in 2001 when we had system control properly done and now we have um, our, our frequency control to the histogram that is available now. And then if we look at what's happened since we've started reintroducing the frequency control, you can see the histogram, this is published and this is the June report from AEMO, it's weighted slightly towards the higher end of the band. Why is it such a bad histogram? most likely because of the drafting of the way the rule was uh, introducing a dead band where AEMO could not ask you to just respond to frequency. They, they put a limit in there. Uh, probably also because everybody's following their dispatch target and this depends on their bias settings as to how well they're actually controlling the frequency. Okay, let's go back to that event. Here it took 70 minutes from woe to go to actually resynchronize Queensland, 70 minutes prior to putting in the primary frequency response. And in May 21, when Calide went down, bearing in mind, let's go back up, they did not lose generation during this event. Their generation stayed on. In this event, they lost 3,000 megs of generation. They went through under frequency load shedding. But in 18 seconds, the frequency in Queensland recovered adequately. And surprisingly enough, the protection systems at Jumeric and at Armadale were such that they could auto reclose and auto reclose with sync check. Now these frequencies don't come together, they're measured in different parts of the network, but clearly there were still wobbles going on and a few things happening, but it took 18 seconds automatically for the interconnector to reconnect. If that interconnector had not reconnected, one could speculate what would have happened in Queensland. Probably. And do we know where it would end? We don't know where it would end. We don't know where it would stop, right? So this is what's really going on out there in the power system. So what are our lessons to take away from this? Chapter four has been changed, but the philosophy that underpins chapter four and how we think about power systems in your textbooks has not changed. What we've done is we've introduced a market mechanism and, uh, it, and those rule changes have taken precedence over our engineered controls. The market dispatch is external to the power system and it cannot replace the primary control. And as I've said before, it causes that open loop control action, you know, open loop to the forecast. Now, if you think about it, there is a vague five minute closed loopy thing with, you know, sort of feeding in, but is that adequate? Because five minutes in a power system is in fact an infinity, All right? Enablement and disablement makes your modeling unpredictable. You do not know where those controls are, whether they are on in a region or off in a region, it's possible under the FCAS market to have no primary control enabled within your region. Recipe for disaster. Single control uh, philosophy of the NEM, it really only works in the steady state. Once we go into a separation event or we're, we're, we're exposing regions to collapse. So we've reintroduced frequency control and uh, all the generators providing dynamic response across all regions. And so that means now a system event doesn't have quite such a bad impact. Changes over time are not evident until a characteristic becomes dominant. It's very hard to see that unless you understand what we had to what we have. 
And that takes examination of past events to current events. And sometimes our current event analysis is not as good as it should be, and certainly not reviewed by engineers. The rules uh, were not drafted to include or to protect system dynamics. It was taken as a given that system dynamics would be understood and obeyed, uh, but in general, that's not the case. So if we think about our ch transitional challenges and just as we finish up, right, we've got to learn and retain our fundamental understanding of power and power system control. We've got to frame problems in first principles. We step back from our detailed modeling because <laughs> everybody's so down in their modeling. We're producing thousands of results in models, I'm just not sure that anybody's actually looking under the bonnet to see whether in fact they A, understand them, interpret them, understand what it means with respect to the power system because we've narrowed everything into a connection application. Please look around, think about the system. Uh, and then really uh, it's assessing rule changes for their impact on power system dynamics and control theory. It's not really done at all. It's done through consensus making. So we have to consider the influence of responses to externality, such as price, for example. What happens when everybody starts responding to price purely and not voltage and frequency? Um, yeah, so I really want to finish up uh, there. I've got a couple of other points, but um, I'm basically saying we do require a power system engineering authority, and we do need it to be independent of the market to really resolve what the transitional control requirements are, given that that's what we could do to the technology that we understand. And now we're introducing the technologies that are new. <laughs> Great. But we've got to combine the two. They have to be coordinated. So I'm going to finish up there and we can go to questions. And there's my references for you. Right. Kate. Um I learned a lot, and so we have uh... certainly <laughs> go, David. Yeah, yeah. Um, in. Yes, we literally had to retune. We had to, and, and in fact, during lockdown, some of the generators were deferring that they couldn't retune because they couldn't bring the OEM into the country to retune their governors, which is pretty sad. Um, but what it meant was, uh, in fact, I've got a slide here. Um, ah, there it is. That was, John Undrell was brought in to give some advice to AEMO, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, if you look at, um, he's basically, he presented from the, in that report, and, and that report's available, uh, un Undrell's report, because they went out, they didn't, they sort of said, yeah, Kate, that's very nice. But now we went off and they did a survey of all the generators, tried to identify what was going on. And then they brought that back. And then they also had John Undrell go through and look at everything and then look at all the generators. And then then they drafted their rule change, hence why it took forever. Um Andrew really sort of said, you know, if the unit load controller um, is looking for constant output, uh, it just ignores frequency. And he was looking at that setting of bias. So if we look at the bias setting in here, he's basically saying, yeah, well, that bias had gone to zero on a lot of the units. They have. They have. We've had. We've got it under Chapter Four. We introduced a mandatory primary frequency response rule. Now, this is where the rulemaking is really interesting. If I look back, there was a rule that was originally in Chapter Four that got taken out when the FCAS market was put in, and that was elegantly drafted by the engineers. <laughs> now we've got a rule that's drafted by lawyers that is much longer, far more complex to understand. And then we've got the arguments within the power system where you've got a lot of people arguing that um, their generators have to work now. This is work and they want to be paid and compensated for the work because they want to be paid to do frequency control, right? Now, 
herein lies our problem. And this is what I was discussing at lunch with you. If you think about it, you can't really see electricity unless you measure it, right? Or, or something's gone seriously wrong, right? Don't be there when it happens. All right. So if you go and think about you're in a power station, you're an asset manager in a power station, what you can see or what you can hear is mechanical noises, vibration and movement. So what has happened is we're starting to get these control systems where they want to make sure that all of those systems are nice and smooth, that there's no mechanical wear and tear. But what they're doing by doing that is they're sacrificing the constant flux model that we underpin in all of our modeling, right? I'm so glad to see you nod because I think about this and it just does my head in. And I've been doing my head in over this for a while ago. And Marion Pitakowski from Tasmania, he said, I hate the way we do frequency, you know, in this country, because we literally are sacrificing the very basis on which we make all our other assumptions that our mathematics underpins, right? So the problem that we've got is that there are a lot of process controls now being available. And I see this rolled out in diesel power stations. I'm seeing it rolled out in... Uh, in gas turbines in Alice Springs, which is really dis dis distressing, where it's all about ramping control, which if you think about it, it's a critically damped response, totally critically damped. Effectively, we're eliminating the dynamic response to a step change. And it's the dynamic response to a step change that actually saves the power system, right? We're cutting it all out. So in Alice Springs, for example, they have a lovely frequency control since they blacked out the place. But the other day, the fellow showed me the 7.3 megawatt system load, 29 megawatts of spinning reserve on the system. Beautiful control. Fantastic. Criminal, given that it's a subsidized gas-powered system. No? Did I say criminal publicly? Sorry. Okay economically fraudulent or something. I don't know what it is, but, you know, it's bad. Like, that does not mean it's efficient at all, right? So we've got to think about what we're doing with these ramping controls and the whole debate about ramping. Yes, are we subservient to the market or are we actually controlling the power system? Because really our customers should have constant frequency and constant voltage. And if we think that a generator, the mechanical bits that go behind a generator have to be looked after, but we put all the movement into the into the electricity. It's not quite right. Okay, so it, it's actually the mechanical bits are there to serve the electricity, not the other way around. Okay, Do I, is another question. Go for it. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm on a soapbox and preaching at the moment. Yeah, go for it. Now it's on. <laughs> That's better. Nobody online heard you. Yeah. 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 It was on, you just turned it off. Takes a little while to kick in. At the frequency. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I toy with different names like independent umpire, you know, all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah, 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 we did. Yeah. Uh, okay, firstly, we don't have an independent umpire, right? There is no engineering body that is an independent umpire. If you go to dispute with AEMO, the panel is weighted with two legal people and one technical person. You can win the technical argument but you will never win the legal argument because the legal people will not challenge the powers that be's rights under the law to make a direction. So you can ignore the laws of physics, you can win. So that's the first problem that we've got. Second problem that we've got is there is no technical leadership. We were talking about the solar PV and the duck curve. If you look at it, we're going to be in a diabolical state pretty soon. It's almost a rampant, obvious that there will be no load on the power system in the high voltage system approximately between the hours of say 12 and 2 and it's fast coming and it's going to happen in the next three to four years and yet there's no technical body and what 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 will be their solution oh kill it all well 
we want to make renewable energy. We want to, we want to, we've got to be, have fast acting to get controls adequately distributed throughout the system, capturing that energy to use it when we get the peak at the, after the sun goes down. Yeah, the objectives. Yeah. Oh, well, otherwise lights will go out, won't they? Uh, seriously. I mean, you know, there's a market. Yippee, we make money. What happens when the electricity goes off? Every widget maker, you know, hospitals drop, people drop dead, traffic lights go out, you name it. I mean, phew. and we never really got to the bottom of the system black in South Australia. But you now be careful what I say then, okay? Oh, good question, David. Good question. Yeah, ask it again. Don't turn it off. <laughs> Battery. Speak it louder. I'll repeat the question. I'll repeat the question. Yeah, just, just ask. Oh, you mean an authority? Yeah. So in the US, they have uh, that. Firstly, they have the FERC, which is their federal energy that thing. Then they have the NERC, which is the National El Electricity Reliability Council or Corporation. Now, I'm not sure. Anyway, the C is there, and that technically is meant to set what you can and can't do on a power system. I'm not sure whether. Uh, you know, just how strong that authority is. And, of course, the FERC and the NREL, that National Renewable Energy Laboratory, they do a lot of really good work. Um, I just don't think that... I, I think it's a nature of our power system being long and skinny. This is a slide that I didn't incorporate, but I thought it would come up in conversation because I had to shorten it to 40 minutes or you'll be here forever. Um, our power system is long and skinny, a lot of our population is within our CBDs. We've got a lot of spread out rural areas. You have to remember, and this is what annoys me with the system strength discussion, is that most of the rural areas were electrified in the 60s and the 70s, and they were designed to provide our agricultural you know, uh, areas with power. They were not designed to be the transmission network for the future generation. But in the open access regime, we're dumping heaps of generation in there. You can have more than the rating of the line connected to it. Everybody's fighting, competing to get their power out under the constraints. Um, they've got all sorts of runback schemes implemented all over the place. And we're not designing transmission to actually do what it should be doing. So we have a fundamental circuit theory problem. We have high power transfer in high impedance areas. Then we have fast acting voltage control loops trying to inject excessive IQ under certain circumstances. And then we have a surprise, surprise, what happens when they interact with each other? We're on the borderline of power system, you know, power transfer collapse, where your voltage stability is marginal and then you've got a problem. Did I sum it up in one go? That's, don't, okay, cool. No. So, and of course, our country has always been oscillatory. This is actually from a Peter Wallace presentation. Thank you, Peter. So just reminding everybody that oscillations happen, right? This is 1975. And uh, this was a small signal instability. And you can see there, 10 seconds, you can see that that's an electromechanical interaction. Right? If we go back up to our other one, it was 24 seconds per peak, which effectively means it's coming from somewhere else. Right? It's no longer if we go back up, if we go back up to yeah, that one, that one, right? That's about 20, I think it was 22 seconds or 24 seconds that we measured on that one. I can't remember. Uh, but, you know, you look at that, that's an external controller with really, and, and there's a note that I 
can't see my notes in here, but there's a note that one of the specialists, uh, oh, no, 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 I don't want to stop sharing. I was going to go to the notes page. Um, he said, this is the type of limited cycle interactions where you don't understand the, the dynamics that you're trying to control effectively, you know. Sorry. Yep. All different. Yep. Ooh, ooh. Uh, now this is where this is where we get to the question of what's going on in generator connections where we've got a wide area PSCAD model. Firstly, the more detail you put into your model, the less likely it is to be accurate, right? We need to lift ourselves. This is why I sort of present on the frequency dynamics model, because if you think about that area control model, we need to develop that for the transitional purpose and incorporate what we, what we would, uh, um, uh, how we expect batteries to control, how we expect solar farms to control and wind farms. We could put external power resource forecasty thingies on the back end of them and still create our dynamic response, right? We haven't done that yet. We haven't adjusted our load frequency dependency representation. Do we still have frequency dependent loads? I think yes, but they're probably a smaller proportion than what they were, right? But a lot of people haven't like people think that everything's new. No, it's not. Like you go down to Portland and you check out what they're doing down there at the aluminium smelter. Uh -uh. It, it, it's still as it was designed in 1985 with a couple of extra bits. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yep. Yes. Um, a gas turbine is still a synchronous machine, so it will supply to the ability of its classical model, its inertia and other things. But I've seen a lot of controls on gas turbines that are pretty ordinary. So unless we actually start to understand whether or not we're tuning our AVRs correctly and we're tuning our governors correctly and our reciprocating machines are able to do the best they can with respect to dynamics, from my point of view, I keep getting asked for the station control model, which is going to control all those units, defeat their response to the power system and control them in accordance with an external ramp. So if your gas turbine is being controlled like that, then no, it won't provide stability. It will just provide a ramping response. Oh, the transitional question. Well, I don't. Well, I, I I don't think I'll go into particular technology types. As far as I'm concerned, we will have synchronous machines on the system for a very long time. We've got hydro machines. We've got we we're going to have some gas around, you know, particularly, and it's just a matter of the way that we solve. Uh, how we're going to control the volume of renewable energy. And that then the problem that we've got at the moment is everybody's treating the system like it's infinite. Lots and lots of gigawatts of projects being planned. Our load is actually going down, not going up. And the market was designed around incentivizing the next generator to meet the next load megawatt up. <laughs> and we're going down. Uh, well, yes, we will electrify things. The question is how that will be solved. I don't know. But the bottom line is the controls on any unit on the system needs to be managed. Yeah. Yeah. 
mean to just follow up on the whole thing. So you might feel like our bearing can follow a few reasons, but after that, you might be like, you know, do this. Um, yeah, but if you look at if you look at the the, the asynchronous response to frequency, it's constant because it will produce the same power regardless of what the frequency is doing because of the slip and the other ways that they work. So, so you know, you, you sort of we have to think about that. So that's a stabilizing impact, really. Like they are not going to rock and roll when you have an event, right? So they're just going to keep doing what they're doing, which is lovely. I like it. It's good, but we have to understand. The bits that are rock and rolling, what are they doing, and are they doing it correctly, uh, and uh, have we got them damped? Um, and the issue that what happens, and this is where the inertia question comes into it, because effectively you're getting less inertia in the system as we decommission. Oh, Hazelwood's gone, right? So as we decommission, um, technically a lighter system should be easier to control, right? And we're going to have lots of BESS around. So technically, if we do it properly, we should be able to really well control a light system, right? So people keep thinking they need lots of inertia. Well, the only time you need lots of inertia is if you, A, don't have enough arresting frequency fast, like, like contribution fast enough, right? So technically in a light system, we should be able to control it better. That's the first thing. So as we get more solar farms and wind farms, they're actually having a stabilizing influence for that. When we, we, we get a lot of, you know, separation, I don't think we've yet understood that. I'm, I'm, I don't trust our system models anymore. They're too complex. I, I, we need to go back to some, some fundamental, simple, like this frequency inertial swing equation sort of assessment of what's going on when we put two areas together. You can do it in MATLAB. I've done it in MATLAB. Yeah, yeah, it's a technical issue, yeah. And yeah, yeah, everything is taken as a market issue and hence why I'm calling for, I'm calling for a, a technical engineering body because we have, what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to create an energy transition without informed power engineering or system engineering influencing what's happening. We have connections, individual connections going on, and we have some thinking, but we have not seen the overarching system plan. And don't take me to the ISP because it really doesn't actually tell you how it's going to be achieved. No, correct. Yeah. Yes, correct. And that's why I think we have to re reconsider where the technical rules, chapter four and chapter five reside, because they don't really reside as market rules. And we've seen detraction. Yes, David. Mm. Mm -hmm. They're linearizations, yes, yes. <laughs> A mix, yeah. Correct, correct. So, so it's almost like, it's like in order to solve the transitional problem, for, Forget the complex, you know, wide area, blah, blah, blah going on. What we need to do is elevate it into a, a fundamental simplified model, if you like, in order to solve that problem for what does it look like for a region and then develop that into a concept of what are the controls necessary for those blocks to integrate. Hang on a minute. Okay, I'm just going to take that. Uh, that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, firstly, the use of stability is, I think, incorrect. Um, uh, when we think about power system stability problems and renewable energy, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, you know, is it is it <laughs> the voltage control loop going berserk, or is it is it is this is this an instability problem here? Seven minutes. So the renewable energy there is demonstrating it to be more stable than the synchronous machines. So that's so so yeah. Let's reframe this. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So what are we what are we trying to solve? We're trying to solve how to maintain constant frequency, constant voltage, and supply it through renewable energy. Isn't that what we're trying to do? So the problem that we've got with renewable energy, if we think about our equation, we used to control the power in to match the power out. And now we've got a situation where the renewable energy, we're trying to maximize the power out to the available resource that comes in. Somewhere in there, we have to have the buffer to have the volume of controlled energy to make sure that the electrical system is served correctly, right? So we haven't quite solved that. And if we look at the rules and we look at the integration rules for batteries, for example, it's becoming more difficult, more complex, more regulatory problems in the rules themselves. If I was a control system engineer and I had my druthers, I would basically look at every renewable energy project now, grid connected or grid size, and they're getting bigger. And I'd just basically say 10% at least of all your capacity storage. Integrate it behind your connection point. I mean, this is me just off the top of my head, right? Okay, I haven't done the economics on it. You, that's your problem. But if we thought about that, we would have a proportion of controlled energy behind every connection point that would enable us to know how much we have for the forward looking period. So if you think about it, your problem as a power system operator is that you need to know that you have enough energy to meet the next five minutes, the next 15, the next hour, the next 24 hours, right? That's your problem. You wanna know you've got enough spinning reserve or reserve, whether it's stored reserve or whether it's spinning reserve, doesn't matter. The bottom line is you need to have enough electricity to cover for the contingent cases that can occur. And you've got enough control of it to know that it can be drawn on, right? I didn't answer that percentage. I don't know what that percentage is. That technology is changing. Yeah. Hmm. And the technology in the inverters is changing all the time, right? Yeah. So, so the problem that we've got is, are we looking at older inverter interactions like BassLink, for example? BassLink is a case in point because it requires a particular fault level to be able to operate in a stable manner, right? So if we think about that, we've got legacy equipment, which may cause issues. Do we have the right to change our system so much that the legacy equipment falls over, gets damaged? Mm, we might need to think about that. Okay, thank you. Does this work? Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to lean in so they can hear me at least online. Thanks very much, Kate. Please help uh, me welcome, uh, sorry, thank Kate.